Good morning. Am I on? Okay. There we go. Now I'm on. Nice to see you guys out here this morning and, um, you know, be here worshiping with you. If you're new here, if you're turning, or tuning in via the internet, my name's Trevor Rolls. It's my pleasure to be delivering the message this morning. Pastor Dave is here. Um, but again, with the ministry fair coming up, we decided to take this opportunity to sort of switch roles for the day. And so he did the Sunday school and I'm doing the sermon. So for the remainder of the morning, we're going to be talking about something that I have written on extensively during my time in undergraduate and seminary school and also something that I intend to continue studying and writing about. And this is the concept, the biblical truth that we as human beings are created in the image and in the likeness of Almighty God. So there are several scriptures that we could visit to discuss this, and indeed I probably will hit on many of them, but for the direction that I want to go in, starting this morning, talking about living in the image of God, I want to look at John chapter 4, verse 24. John 4, 24, which reads, God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So now to give a little context to the statement made by Jesus here, He's talking to a Samaritan woman, and she's starting to ask Him about worshiping God. And she's asking about how their ancestors worshipped here on this mountain where they now stood, but that it's said by you Jewish people, that Jerusalem is the only place to really worship God. And this is what Jesus says in response. John 4, 21 through 23. Jesus says, Believe me, a time is coming when neither here on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will be the right place to worship God. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers of God will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now it's almost like Jesus, surprise, surprise, knows that this statement might cause someone to think something like, what does that even mean? (laughs) Because verse 24, our primary verse this morning, is basically an answer to that question. It's like Jesus says, The time has come when we no longer worship the way we used to, which, by the way, to answer your question, woman at the well, was properly done in the temple at Jerusalem as it was commanded by God to do. Yes, all the the strange, peculiar things about first century Jewish-centered temple worship, the robes, the incense, the sacrifices of doves and bulls and goats, all these things that might make the modern-day evangelical Protestant kind of wag the finger and call it workspace religion, all those things were commanded by God to do. That's how he told them to worship him. That's why Jesus says, you worship what you don't even know, but we worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. And we are doing what God commanded, and you are not. But plot, tri- uh, plot twist here that God is now going to be doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing now. So earlier in their conversation, when he asked her for water, she basically says, you know who I am, a Samaritan woman, and yet you're asking me for water? And Jesus replies, yeah, but if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for my water. Because John 4.13, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that I'm going to give will never thirst. The water that I give will become in him a living well, a living spring of water, springing up to eternal life. So in other words, the old way was never meant as the be-all, end-all way to worship God. Everyone who drinks of that water, that water of works, the water of this mountain or that mountain, will always be left having to come back for more. And even though God gave us a temporary well to drink from in the temple in Jerusalem, God always had a further phase of his plan in mind. And a time will come, says Jesus, and is now here when that old dispensation ends and the new dispensation begins. 
The old way to worship God ends now, and the new way to worship God begins now. The old covenant has run its course, and the new covenant will begin now. So the answer to your question, woman at the well, is that yes, God commanded and appointed the temple in Jerusalem and all the rituals encompassing that worship system to be the right way to worship Him until now, until Messiah comes. But now that I'm here, the new and better way comes with me. Now that I'm here and have the living water, verse 23, true worshipers will now worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Cool. But what does that mean? I'm super glad that I don't have to be Jewish and go all the way to Jerusalem to worship. But if I'm honest, and I'm not pretending to be all super spiritual and know all about these things, I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. And if I'm that woman, of course you don't. How could anyone? This is a brand new thing. When this is happening, this is a brand new thing, completely unheard of in the past. But Jesus is basically saying, let me explain it to you. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. God is spirit. This means God is quite different than us or anything else in this place. And we can see this all throughout Scripture. Jesus says, Spirit does not have flesh and bones. That's in Luke 24, 39. Job says that God doesn't have eyes of flesh. Job 10, 4. Acts 17, 24 says, The God who made this world made all of it and everything in it, and since He is Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. In verse 29 that God's divine nature is not like silver or gold or stone. God's not in this place. He's not of this place. He's not like this place. He doesn't age. He doesn't break. He doesn't rust or decay. He's immutable. He's infallible. He's incorruptible. He's unstoppable. He's everywhere. He's in all times. He's with all power. He has all knowledge, all understanding. He's able to do all things. And ultimately, He is in control of the fate of all creation because it's all His anyways. He made it from the outside in. Psalm chapter 102, verse 25 through 27 says, In the beginning you laid the foundation of the earth. In the beginning you laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. So this one little statement, God is spirit. It means so much regarding how apart he is from everything that we experience. Our whole reality, our whole lived experience is creation, it's matter, it's forces, fields, time, motion, molecules. It's McDonald's and monitors and books and buildings. That's what we experience. But God, God is spirit. He's something different. In the beginning, he laid the foundation for all of that, for everything we know. Meaning before there ever was anything, he was there. Before there was a universe, he was there. Before time even existed, he was there. And John writes of this in the beginning of his gospel, John 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him no thing that has been made was made. So all things created were created by God, which means whatever He is, Whatever God is, it's nothing like everything else that we see. Indeed, it isn't even anything we see at all, since this is all created stuff. Everything you see or have ever known is created stuff, and God is different and apart from that. 1 John 4.12 says, No one has ever seen God. 
No one has ever seen God the Father at any time. John 5.37 says, You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. And Paul writes that God's attributes and nature are, are invisible to us in Romans 1.20, but they are reflected throughout his creation. And Jesus says all throughout the book of John that nobody has ever seen the Father. Indeed, only he has seen the Father, but that he and the Father are one. And in John 14.9, He that hath seen me, says Jesus, has seen the Father. So God is spirit. Nobody has seen him except in the incarnation of Jesus, who prior to the incarnation and even prior to creation, as John 1, 1 through 3 showed, was unified with God the Father in eternity past, in this spirit state. So interestingly now, when we consider the opening of John's gospel, it's obvious from a Hebrew perspective also that John was modeling the opening of his gospel against the opening of Genesis, which says in its first three verses, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form, it was void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So of course now, thousands of years after the scripture was written, we as a species are just kind of starting to figure out that the foundation of all matter is light. And without getting into the technical physics of it all, God saying, let there be light, was the calling into existence the very foundation of all creation as we know it. So God created this whole thing from the outside, and it's also very different from what he is, but he wanted to put something of himself back into it. And as we see in Genesis 1:26, God says, "Let us make man in our image and according to our likeness." And of course, as we just learned from John, the reason for all this us and our language is that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we're all present here at this time doing this thing, this act of creation unified together as one. So let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Of all creation, God said of mankind, let us make this part of creation directly in our image. In a reality where nothing else is like us, says God, let us make this one thing, this one part of creation, in some way the same as us. Genesis 2.7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath. That is in Hebrew, he breathed into the man ruach, the spirit. He breathed into the man spirit. Now this is the only part of creation described this way. It's like first God says, let there be light, the foundation of all matter, and then from that he made everything else except humanity. This one piece of creation this pinnacle of his labor, God said, I want this to be different. I want this to be like what I am. And he, in what can only be described as in an intimate way, breathed ruach, breathed spirit into man. God gave man a component to his being that is like what God is. God gave man ruach. And this means man is made of two things unlike the rest of creation. Man is made of matter, dirt, space dust, as it were, same stuff everything else is made of, but man is also made of something different, some sort of other substance, this thing called ruach, this thing called spirit, this part that is like God. So man's being is a duality. In fact, in an academic setting, this is, this is what they call it. This is what they call this model of human ontology, of human anthropology. They call it substance dualism. We're made of two substances, the physical and the spiritual. And incidentally, this is not typically a materialistic view of what humans are. If you're some so sort of like an atheist scientist or philosopher or something, or really just an atheist person, then you would balk at this model. You would say, this can't be. This cannot be the, the way humans are. Humans are nothing more than a sophisticated combinatorial arrangement, a mariological aggregate of molecules and matter. That's all we can be. But that's not what the scripture teaches. Remember, dirt and the ruach, the breath of life, 
the spirit. Matter and spirit. So indeed, not just Genesis though, but all throughout the scripture, we see this supported. And this morning I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians 2.11, which says this. 1 Corinthians 2.11. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the capital S, Spirit of God. So man has a small spirit, God has capital spirit. So see, we're different than everything else because we have this spirit. Matter can't know thoughts. Matter can't know thoughts. Trees and rocks don't know thoughts. The ocean doesn't know thoughts. Contrary to popular New Age culture. The universe doesn't know thoughts. And I know a lot of animal lovers out there might say, ah, but my dog has thoughts. Yes, Fido has thoughts. But having thoughts and knowing thoughts are completely different things. You as a human, as someone created in the image of God, you have the unique ability to know your thoughts. To have thoughts about your thoughts and to orchestrate these things into higher level cognitive capacity, you can reflect, you can evaluate. And I'm going to tell you something. This is cutting edge. In the areas of philosophy and neuroscience, this is cutting edge inquiry to suggest in a meaningful way that there is such a thing as a spirit. And that it is this very spirit which is the reason for our higher level cognitive function, for reflective thought, for unified conscious experience. And yet here we see Paul some 2,000 years ago before brain scans and fMRIs and all this, any of this other stuff. Who can know thoughts except the spirit? Who knows a man's thoughts except his spirit inside of him? So before I said, right, the naturalists, the physicalists, the atheists, as it were, they're going to deny such a thing as a spirit exists. And this isn't because there's no evidence or leading towards it, as you would expect, from those holding a scientific worldview, but it's because there has no place for the spirit in their model of reality. There's no place for something that's not physical or a force. For them, there can be no... It's not that it doesn't exist. It can't exist. You can't have a spirit. And yet there are so many phenomena in human experience that can only be explained by your spirit. And that's not what I'm supposed to be talking about this morning, given all these spirit evidences and all that. But I'll give you one example. Here's one that I've been chewing on lately. Have you guys ever heard of a placebo? Anyone ever heard of a placebo? Okay. Placebo is when, and I'll try to say this as non-technical as possible, a placebo is commonly when a person is given something, a substance, a chemical, a drug, or some sort, only it's not the drug. It's actually a sugar cube or some other thing, right, with no chemical effect to it. But yet, what we see happening is that because the person believes that they're getting the drug, they experience the effect of the drug. So, okay, so what, right? Well, technically speaking, if we're just spiritless meat machines, then chemistry does what chemistry does. It either has the chemical effect or it doesn't. No chemicals, no effect. But we have these non-physical components to us as human beings created in the image of God. We have this ruach, we have this spirit which is able to execute causal powers over our physical bodies which should technically only respond to biochemical stimulus. So like I said, we have these things happening and other things like it and the ruach, the spirit, explains them exceptionally well. But on a world made up of solely matter and molecules, there could be no spirit because there is no source of spiritual things. But the scripture is clear. God is spirit. He is spirit. He is the source of spirit. And he made us in his image. He breathed the Ruach into mankind. He gave us spirit, which is why we have higher level thought, reflection, intentionality. And it's why we have causal powers and free will to act in this otherwise physical cause and effect universe. And it's also why, incidentally, that when the time was right, 
when the Messiah, Jesus, came to fulfill the law, came to replace the temple, the temple was the only way you could go to God. Now Jesus says, no man comes to the Father except through me. I'm the only way to go to get to God now, to get to the Father. So when he came to do that, now in this new time, the only way to worship God will be in the Spirit and in truth. Now here's what this means. Because the essence of who God is is not physical. Because the essence of who you and I are is not physical. Then the true essence of worship to Him is not physical. This means it does not inherently matter what clothes I wear. It does not inherently matter which songs I sing or who wrote them. It does not matter what color the ink in my Bible is, whether it's red letter or blue letter, black letter, it doesn't matter. It does not in and of itself matter how much money I give. It doesn't matter objectively if I go out and feed a homeless person or help old ladies cross the street. The scripture says in 2 Peter 3.10 that the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. All the works of the earth will be burned up. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says that in that day, every work, everything that you do will be tried and tested by fire. And all work not built on the foundation of Christ will be burnt up. So what does it mean to be built on the foundation of Christ? Well, let's look at what Christ has to say. Matthew 6.1 Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others so that it's seen by them. And I would say, this doesn't mean do all your things in, you know, Nobody can see me do anything, but if you're doing it so that they see you, you will not have a reward from the Father in heaven. So Jesus is saying, if you're doing things so others can see them, then you have no spiritual value. They'll be burned away. Your motive's wrong. And when you do things, even good things, even acts of worship, right? When we do them to get attention from other people, look at me, look at me, look what I can do. God's not impressed by that. Jesus says in verse 2 that when people do things for selfish motives to be honored by others, truly I tell you, this is Jesus' words, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. See, it's not the things themselves that matter, but it's the spirit of them. Because there will come a time when all things physical will be burned away and only spiritual reality will be left. And of course, this is not really a biblical mystery. I think of Jesus in Matthew 5 trying to communicate this spiritual reality to us. He says in Matthew 5, 21, You have heard it was said, Thou shalt not kill. And whoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I'm going to say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And then down in verse 27, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And Jesus is saying, look, it's not all about what you do or don't do with your hands that matters. It's about what you do or don't do in your heart that matters more. And we could say it, we could say it is the spirit of the action that matters. And sure, I didn't murder anybody with my hands, but I might have a murderous heart towards them, and God sees that. And sure, I didn't commit adultery with anyone with my physical body, but I have a lustful heart towards them, and God sees that. The reality is Jesus is trying to convey here what is more important. And it's not that what we do doesn't matter, but God's trying to say, I'm seeing the heart of you. This is what God said to Samuel when Samuel went down to, to pick the king, to anoint David. 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord said to Samuel, 
do not look on his appearance, on his height, on his stature, because I've rejected him already. Not talking about David, talking about the other. I've rejected him already. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on to the heart. God doesn't see things the way we do in physical terms. No, God sees the spiritual reality of things. Why? Because He is spirit. That's what He is. 1 Chronicles 28.9 says, The Lord searches every heart. The Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. Which brings me back to 1 Corinthians 2.11, right? Who knows the thoughts except the spirit? It's not just God who is spirit. The realest part of you and I is spirit as well. That's why as we just read, God can see past all these molecules in this matter. He can see right through all that stuff. He can see right past our bodies, our, our, our outer shell, this dust from the ground. God sees past all that and He looks right into our ruach, right into the part of us that's like Him. And He can see our every desire and thought. So when we look back to the woman at the well in John 4 and she says, hey Jesus we think it's right to worship God here we think that's right like our traditions tell us but you Jews say it's right to worship God over there like your traditions tell you Jesus, he, he basically says I'm about to blow this whole thing wide open for you all that stuff's dust from the ground it's dust all this stuff is dust from the ground. Proverbs 21.2 says, Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. So see, deep down, perhaps not so deep down, we all think we're right. My Bible's the right Bible. My music's the right music. My way of running ministry is the right way. And I wear the right kind of clothes to church and me, 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 and my, 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 and I, I, I. Space dust, molecules, matter to be burned away. There will come a time, and that time is here, when none of that stuff matters. You are a spirit-centered being, given the Ruach. You have something nothing else in creation has. You are created in the image and in the likeness of God. Jesus says, God is spirit, and the only way to worship Him is in spirit and in truth. And so now as I'm kind of, looks like I'm getting down to the end of my pages here, I will say this. God has given you a component to your being that is like He is, right? I already, I already said that like 37 times. He made us out of this other stuff, dirt, but He also made us out of this thing that, that's like Him. Now I want to be really careful here. Now, I'm not saying that we have God in us. That's a Gnostic thought, that you have a, a God spark in you, that there's a piece of God. Right? So he didn't say, I'm making you God, and you're God, and you God, but he did say, I'm going to make them like us. I'm going to make them like us. He made all this other stuff out of dirt. So when you bring all this other stuff to him in worship, you're bringing him dirt. Isaiah 64, Isaiah 64, 6. All our works are like filthy rags. All of us wither like a leaf. It's dirt. There's nothing you can bring God that really matters except this one thing. The thing that He gave you. This thing that is like He is, this Ruach Spirit. John 4, 24. God is Spirit. Those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So worshiping God in spirit and in truth is this then. Living life in the image of God is this. To live life in such a way, to conduct myself in such a way, to honor God in such a way where all my actions, all my activities, all the things I do here in this physical world, so I have to do things, all right, so I'm not saying don't do anything and just think happy thoughts. We have to do things. 
God called us to do things. But what do you call it when you just do things for God without any relational aspect, without any love for Him, without any spirit involved in it? We call that yucky religious stuff, right? That's that yucky religious stuff. And so what happens is, even the Jewish people who were doing the things that God told them to do, all that bulls and goats and sacrifices and all that stuff, He told them to do that, they lost Him in it. They lost the spirit of it. And they're just doing the stuff, right? So it's not that stuff doesn't matter. But absent any spirit, it's just dust. It's just stuff that'll be burned away. All the things in the world will be burned away by fire. So when we do things, when we sign up for the ministry fair, can I get the worship team? I need you guys. I'm almost done. When we sign up for the ministry fair, when we serve in soup kitchens, when we help the homeless, when we help the widows, when we give our tithes and offerings, all these things, we need to infuse these things with the only thing that I have that has the type of existence, the type of being to survive the testing and burning away that will be the weighing of all things. That's the Spirit. Living in the image of God, worshiping Him with the Spirit given to me by Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for giving us this part of ourselves, Lord, that has the capacity to thrive and survive all the deception and the decay of this physical world. God, we thank You so much for this this Ruach, this Spirit, Lord, this thing that's like You. And we pray, all of us here, we pray that as we go out into the world, that we're able to live our lives in Your image, Lord, and in Your likeness, in the Spirit and by the power of Your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.